My name is Teresa Sandock. I'm a Servite sister and a member of the Tuesdays with Merton Planning Committee, along with Daniel Horan and Alan Colt. Dan is a Franciscan friar and director of the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana. Alan is a faculty in residence at Baldwin Wallace University and former holder of the university's chair in faith and life. He also serves on the board of directors of the International Thomas Merton Society. Tuesdays with Merton is co-sponsored by the International Thomas Merton Society and the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Patrick F. O'Connell, one of America's preeminent Merton scholars known internationally for his work. Pat is a founding member and former president of the International Thomas Merton Society. He is editor of the ITMS quarterly publication, The Merton Seasonal, and co-author with Christine Bochen and William Shannon of the Thomas Merton Encyclopedia. He has edited 12 volumes of Thomas Merton's monastic conferences, including Liturgical Feasts and Seasons, Selected Essays, early essays from 1947 to 1952, and Cistercian Fathers and Forefathers, as well as a book of essays on Merton and Confucianism. He is Professor Emeritus at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. Here now is Patrick O'Connell speaking on Beyond the Blurbs, Thomas Merton and St. Augustine. Pat? Thank you, Teresa, and thank you, uh, for inviting me to do this. And thank you for all those out in Zoom land who have uh, tuned in. Glad to have you here. Um, I'd like to begin with two quite short prayers. Uh, one of them, I think, familiar to most of us from St. Augustine and one not so familiar from Merton uh, that I don't think was written as a response to Augustine, but, but sounds uh, like it could have been. So uh, with St. Augustine, we say, um, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until we rest in you. And with Thomas Merton, we pray, let me rest in your will and be silent. Then the light of your joy will warm my life. Its fire will burn in my heart and shine for your glory. This is what I live for. Amen. Amen. Well, I was going to start this uh, by saying that uh, um, the connection between St. Augustine and, and Thomas Merton uh, is evident before you even open Merton's autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain. Uh, but I found out actually uh, rather recently looking at uh, the virtual tour that uh, Mark Mead has put together um, of, for the 75th anniversary of the publication of Seven Story Mountain, which if you haven't seen it, it's really a wonderful uh, thing. But I found out from there, the first edition anyway of, of Merton's autobiography, you have to open it at least to the, you have to open the front cover because the blurbs, the, uh, the endorsements are actually on, the, on the, the flap inside the front cover rather than on the back of the book. Uh, so, but you don't, you don't have to go that any further than that uh, before you see uh, Fulton J. Sheen, who was not Bishop Sheen, he was just Monsignor Sheen at the time, uh, um, saying this about, uh, about the book. He says, a 20th century form of the Confessions of St. Augustine, it will do far more good for souls than treatises on apologetics and philosophy. So uh, when we do open the book, of course, uh, Augustine plays a significant role in uh, the story that Merton tells about himself. Um, most of us probably are familiar with one of the most familiar scenes of uh, uh, that Merton talks about, which is where uh, the Hindu monk Brahmachari is talking to Merton. He's come to this country uh, to go to the World's Fair and gets there <laughs> after it ends. Uh, but anyway, he, he befriends uh, Merton and, uh, and his pals. Uh, and there's one place where um, he's talking to Merton. He says, uh, he did not generally put his words in the form of advice, but the one counsel he did give me is something that I will not easily forget. There are many beautiful mystical books written by the Christians, 
you should read St. Augustine's Confessions and the Imitation of Christ. He repeated what he had said, not without a certain earnestness. Yes, you must read these books. It was not often that he spoke with this kind of emphasis. Now that I look back on those days, it seems to me very probable that one of the reasons why God had brought him all the way from India was that he might say just that. So I think our assumption is, uh, at least my assumption for a long time was that Merton goes out and gets the, the confessions and he reads it uh, and the rest is history, uh, except he doesn't, at least he doesn't right away. Uh, so it, is, it isn't quite history. Um, there's another scene, uh, this happens in, in the summer of, of 1938. And uh, shortly after that, Merton starts taking instructions. He's getting ready to, uh, uh, to be baptized at Corpus Christi Church. Uh, and then in the fall, uh, he uh, talks to his philosophy teacher, Dan Walsh, who of course is the one who encourages him to visit Gethsemane for the first time. And it kind of sets that whole uh, Cistercian um, uh, journey uh, at, the, at the very beginning of things. But uh, this is the first conversation that he really has with Dan Walsh. Uh, he says, one of the things he sensed at once was something that I was far from being able to realize, but it was that the bent of my mind was essentially Augustinian. I realized that he meant that my bent was not so much toward the intellectual, dialectical, speculative character of Thomism as toward the spiritual, mystical, voluntaristic, and practical way of St. Augustine and his followers. So there's Augustine popping up again in another important conversation. But the interesting thing about uh, when Merton uh, is talking about this, he says, I had not yet followed Brahmachari's advice to read St. Augustine. <laughs> so, uh, so he, he uh, really remembers it, but he doesn't run out and do it. Um, and uh, it's not until uh, he's up in Olean, up at the, uh, um, the cottage that he and his friends are staying at, that's Bob Lax's brother-in-law's cottage um, in the summer of 1939. And he says, uh, the closest I got to, to using the solitude for meditation was when I spent a few afternoons under a little peach tree in the high grass of what might've been a lawn and read at last St. Augustine's Confessions. Uh, so it's a good deal later on, although it, he's not quite accurate there. Um, because on the very first page of his first volume of journals, on the very first page of what becomes Run to the Mountain, page three, um, he, uh, he says, St. Augustine's problems are everybody's, except he did not have a war to worry him. The 12th chapter of book seven is magnificent. Um, book seven of the, uh, of the confessions he's talking about. Evil, the deficiency of good, everything that is, is good, by virtue of its mere existence. Corruptibility implies goodness. Right? Uh, so as a matter of fact, he must have started reading it, presumably, unless he just dipped by chance into, uh, into book seven, but evidently he had got up to book seven uh, uh, in uh, May, which is when this, this first entry in the, uh, in the journal takes place, uh, and then read some more after, um, after he, he gets to, uh, to Olean. And evidently he's still reading it because there are about eight or nine other, other little comments that he makes uh, in uh, September and in October and then into November of 1939 where he's talking about various places in the, in the confession. So evidently it's spread out over a longer period of time. And uh, the interesting thing about it really is that um, uh, He's reading it not so much as the future uh, writer of the uh, of the 20th century confessions or the great spiritual writer. He's reading it uh, largely as uh, a uh, graduate uh, student in English literature, which is which is what he actually was at the time. Uh, just a couple of of entries that he's got there. This is one is from uh, October sixth. Uh, he says, uh, and this is so, this is so Merton, I think. He says, Cicero's Latin is no more correct than Augustine's. It's simply more Ciceronian. Uh, and then he says, uh, I have, I admit, read more of Cicero's Latin than Augustine's. Uh, 
But to judge by Augustine in translation, I like his prose better. Although I'm a great sucker for Ciceronian periods and love them most fondly, yet rather for parody, but Augustine is simply too good to like that way, not, not a suspicion of liking him for possibilities of parody. <laughs> so we see him kind of going back and forth. He's uh, 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 Augustine is just as good a Latin writer as, as uh, Cicero is just different. Oh, I actually haven't read that much of, of uh, Augustine in Latin and then kind of going back and forth. And the very last thing that he says, and this one is actually something that he also has in the in the secular journal and it's he rewrites it quite a bit but i'm going to read the what he has in the original uh, he says saint augustine is a rhetorician he persuades he's a preacher his logic is the logic of language of literary expression of poetry and so on his books move and grow and are full of their own life and they grow towards the truth and embrace it the way a tree growing up reaching into the light and air and embracing it in an airy cage where light and air move sweetly and freely in and out. What Augustine is interested in is his own religious experience. He narrates it over and over. The center of his philosophy is the confessions. He addresses himself to Christians. He's a rhetorician. He does not need to bother with philosophy. The truth is already established in revelation. It's there. You do not have to go far looking for it and worrying about it as the ancients did. The truth is there. He expatiates on it, he talks about it beautifully, pays a tribute of beautiful words and rich love and great understanding. Uh, so that's his approach to Augustine when it starts. He, he's just kind of captured by Augustine's style and by Augustine's approach to things. So one other thing that he says in the, uh, in the Seventh Story Mountain, he says a number of other things about Augustine in the Seventh Story Mountain, but the, the one other thing that's important uh, he's talking about his early uh, time in the novitiate uh, when he used to start writing poetry on uh, um, feast days when they had extra time after vigils, after, after the night office. Uh, he would spend that time uh, before dawn writing poetry until somebody told him, no, that's not, that's not time for writing poetry. It's time for reading. It's time for praying. Um, so uh, in toward the end of Seventh Story Mountain, he says, uh, for six years at that time of day on feast days, I've been reading nothing but one or the other of some three or four books. And the first one that he mentions is St. Augustine's commentary on the Psalms. And then he mentions something by Gregory the Great and Ambrose also on some of the Psalms. And then William of St. Thierry, who is one of the Cistercian fathers. But, uh, but uh, Augustine's commentary on the Psalms is the first thing that he talks about it. And later on, he's actually going to say, this is really the key to Augustinian mysticism as far as he's concerned. So more so than the more famous uh, books that uh, people are more familiar with the titles of anyway, but uh, the commentaries on the Psalms are the things that he really is, is interested in. And, um, uh, and evidently, even after he, he finishes writing The Seven Story Mountain and publishing The Seven Story Mountain, he's still doing this. Uh, there's a passage in uh, Entering the Silence, the second volume of Merton's journals uh, from um, August of 1949. And um, he says, I was turning over in my mind some sentences from St. Augustine's commentary on the 118th Psalm. Right? So he's still doing this evidently. Okay. Uh, and uh, at the end of this, this kind of first uh, decade of his time there, um, he, uh, he writes most of uh, the book that becomes Bread in the Wilderness, which is his, his sort of book on the Psalms, which is published in 1953, but was really written mostly in, 19, in 1950. Um, and there, there are passages in there where he's really drawing on this six or seven or eight years that he's been reading these things. And I'd just like to read you one to give you kind of the flavor of it. Um, and you can see how Augustine is influencing some of Merton's key thoughts and key ideas here. The discovery of our true selves, our own inviolable and individual beings united without confusion in this one mystical person, united to one another in the flame of Christ's infinite and selfless ecstasy of love for his father and for us will constitute one of the purest pure perfections 
of our joy in heaven. Meanwhile, our recital of the Psalms should be a constant progressive discovery of this person, who we all are. We must understand our person, the person of our church, the person of the body of Christ. These are the words of St. Augustine, and it's, it's his commentary on Psalm 61. Uh, and then he says, it is the teaching of the fathers that we all are originally created mystically as one person, and that this person divided by the sin of Adam is reconstituted in one mystical body in Christ, the new Adam, right? Uh, so that sounds like Thomas Merton, true self, false self, and we'll see other passages. Augustine is not the sole source of this by any means, uh, but he certainly is somebody who's contributing to this key understanding that, uh, uh, that Merton has and key way of expressing himself. Um, and then uh, uh, one more thing from this, this early era um, that meanwhile, uh, the modern library um, is looking for somebody to write a preface for uh, the publication of a translation of the City of God, Augustine's City of God, the other real famous one besides uh, the Confessions uh, in the late 1940s. And uh, who do they come up with? Well, who's better than the best-selling author of the modern uh, equivalent of the, of the Confessions? So they, they recruit Thomas Merton to do this. Right. Uh, and Merton, a couple of days before, before Christmas, this is going to come out in 1950, so he's, he's got to get cracking on this. I don't know when they asked him, but uh, um, this is uh, December 23rd of 1949. He says, uh, it is very quiet now in the vault where I pause in my work on the city of God. I'm supposed to be doing a preface for Random House. The work feeds me, strengthens me, knits my powers together in peace and tranquility. The light of God shines to me more serenely through the wide open windows of Augustine than through any other theologian. Augustine is the calmest and clearest light. Right? So pretty high praise. And there are a number of places in uh, these early journals where you know, Augustine's right up there as, as one of the key sources for himself. Uh, uh, just as kind of a parenthesis, a kind of an aside, um, when he's, he's writing about Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, human condition in um, 1960 and how it impresses him and so on and so forth. And then literally in parenthesis, uh, as he's writing about this, he says, I think we could go profitably from this to a reading of the whole city of God, which I've never read right through. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we don't know exactly. Not read right through could mean he, well, he read all the whole thing, but just in different pieces at different times. Uh, but it could well mean I kind of skim part of it. I kind of skim part of those 800 pages before I wrote my introduction. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, and we find out in the introduction, which is only three or four pages long, um, uh, he doesn't seem particularly enthusiastic about the first 10 books. This is where Augustine is uh, uh, refuting the pagan charges that uh, the uh, barbarian sack of Rome and in 410 was uh, because uh, uh, you know they they've deserted the old religion for Christianity and, and so on. Uh, so uh, Merton kind of doesn't spend any time on that, and he, and he suggests actually that Augustine isn't all that interested in that either. Uh, I'm not sure he's right about that, but but anyway, he says uh, the problem that really interested him, the real theme of his work, isn't really engaged until he reaches Book 11, right? And it's there in the the last. 12 uh, books of, of the, uh, the City of God. Uh, that's where he begins, Merton says, the discussion of the origin, history, destiny of the two cities, the City of God and the City of Man, it will be the focus of the remaining 12 books. It is this contrast between the authentic community of those who are united by the love of God and of one another in God and the apparent but insubstantial alliance of individuals each one of whom is intent on the love of himself above all else that Merton is really interested in and uh, uh, that engages his intention as uh, his attention as he says uh, it really engaged Augustine's attention. And he, he quotes this passage from the end of book 14 of the City of God, um, which, is, which is a key. Uh, um, these two cities were made by two loves cupiditas and caritas, self-centered love 
and selfless love for God and God's creation. Only the second can lead to genuine community, true order, lasting peace, because it, in Merton's words, leads the will to the possession of true values and to a love for a supreme and infinite good that cannot be diminished by being shared. In contrast, Merton says, cupidity is doomed from the start to frustration because it's based on a false system of values built on the illusion that created things or ends in themselves, undermined by the everlasting fear of losing whatever may have been gained, the limited supply of material resources that are constantly under threat of being snatched away by others with the same desires, and for a time at least, with superior power. So Merton concludes, the city that is united merely by an alliance of temporal interests cannot promise itself more than a temporary cessation from hostilities, and, an or and its order will never be anything but a makeshift. Uh, so, uh, so this is a key text, and this whole contrast between cupiditas and caritas is one that's going to reappear in many, many different places, many, many different ways, right to the end of his life, as we'll see at the end of the talk. Right? Uh, so, and, but, but more immediately, uh, um, uh, in the mid 1950s, uh, Merton is writing uh, his one dramatic piece, uh, uh, The Tower of Babel, a morality as he, as he subtitles it, uh, uh, in which, uh, the, one of the epigraphs, one of the epigraphs is, is from the book of Genesis, of course, the Tower of Babel uh, episode, and I think it's chapter 11. But the, the other one is from that very same chapter 14 that he had talked about in his introduction to the city of God. And, and uh, um, the first part uh, of, it's divided into two parts, the, the play, and the first part is called the legend of the tower, but the second part is called the city of God. So the first part is, uh, the, the city of man, uh, even though it's not titled that way, Babel, and then the second part, Jerusalem, uh, is uh, is actually entitled uh, the, the city of God. So, so again, it's it's working its way into Merton's vision of things. Um, if we look at the 1950s uh, up to uh, uh, again the turn of the next uh, the next decade, uh, we find that Augustine remains central. Uh, to Merton's writing and to Merton's thinking during this particular time. And the place you see it most clearly is in uh, the, the primary text for Merton's kind of interest in and uh, a drawing on the patristic tradition, which is the book, The New Man, um, which isn't published until 1950, uh, 1961, but was actually written practically completely uh, in the mid 19. Uh, uh, the mid 1950s, 1954 uh, in particular. Um, and not surprisingly, St. Augustine plays a, a real significant role there. Um, the number of passages in which Augustine's drawn. And I'd like to, I'd like to just uh, look briefly at, at three passages there that, that show kind of the, the kind of broad spectrum of the way in which Merton can draw on Augustine. So one of the early chapters in this book is called Image and Likeness, and it's that whole patristic idea uh, that the image of God is something that's there in the very structure of the human being, but the likeness is something that is there only when uh, people are focusing on the true end, on, on God. The likeness is what gets lost in the fall, even though the image is still there. And so he talks about that in terms of Augustine. He says, St. Augustine seeks God in the most intimate depths of his own spirit, at the summit of his own self-realization, which he calls the memoria, memory, but it's more than our idea of memory is remembering stuff. Augustine finds not only himself, but the light by which he sees himself as he really is. And in this light, he's aware of God from whom the, the light comes. His awareness of God instantly broadens out into love. Charity springs up in the illumination of his soul's depths and carries him out of himself and beyond himself to the God who's enthroned in the very summit of his personal being. The image of God is found in the soul's structure, awareness, thought, love. But the likeness of God is effected in the soul 
when these powers receive their own fulfillment and actualization in a spiritual experience of him whose image they are. When the awareness or memoria becomes consciousness of God, when the intelligence is enlightened in a spiritual understanding of God, and when the will raises the whole soul above itself in an ecstasy of love for God, then the image is perfected in likeness. So uh, this is his take on Augustine, uh, the, the movement from kind of the static, the, the thing that's there in the structure, to the dynamic, where that structure is actualized, uh, becomes, act, uh, becomes active, becomes dynamic uh, when it's focused on the goal of awareness and intelligence and love, which ultimately is, is the source and end of all things. Um, then he moves on in, in the book uh, to uh, talk about the Adam and Eve story. And he has a chapter in which he's focusing on uh, the uh, uh, paradise before the fall. Uh, and he has this beautiful, lovely retelling of, of uh, uh, the, uh, what's going on from uh, one of Augustine's uh, numerous uh, commentaries on Genesis. And, this one is uh, the literal, the literal uh, uh, interpretation of, of Genesis. Uh, and this is what he says, part of what he says here in this, in this aspect of things. He says, uh, St. Augustine, who seems to have been very fond of gardening and of all forms of manual labor traditionally assigned to monks, is quick to point out that if Adam worked even in paradise, work is by no means to be regarded by us as an evil nor is it by its nature a penance for sin. He proves this from the nature of the work itself. Adam's whole attitude about work was disinterested. He did not need to work in order to live, but he worked because his soul desired it, says St. Augustine. And then he goes on, the idea of work as a dialogue with reality and with God is beautifully expressed by St. Augustine, who says, what greater or more wonderful spectacle is there or where can human reason better enter into a dialogue with the nature of things than when seeds have been planted, shoots laid out, shrubs transplanted, grafts inserted? It is as though one were questioning each root and seed, asking it what it can do and what it cannot do, whence it derives the power to do it, or why it cannot do it, what help it receives for its own uh, uh, in interior power, and what from exterior help and diligence. And in this dialogue, we come to understand how neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but God who gives the increase. So uh, this real sense of kind of the sacramental aspect of, of the natural world. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, Augustine's very down to earth, uh, digging down in the soil with all this sort of thing. Um, uh, but then he goes on and he, he talks, of course, about the fall. And when he talks about the fall, he consults Augustine again. So here's Augustine, here's Merton on Augustine on, on Genesis. Adam's sin was a double movement of introversion and extroversion. He withdrew from God into himself, and then unable to remain centered in himself, he fell beneath himself into the multiplicity and confusion of exterior things. This is St. Augustine's view of the fall. And he's, he's referring to the De Trinitate, Augustine's treatise on the Trinity. Um, Adam turned human nature inside out, and passed it on in this condition to all his children. Each one of us has the task of turning the thing right side out for himself. And the task is by no means easy. And then he says the, the practical consequence of this was that fallen Adam lived as if there were no common good in the world. His existential knowledge of evil involved him in a complete reorientation of his whole being upon a private good of his own, which had to be first restricted to itself, entrenched within itself, and then defended against every rival. Uh, so the, the, the whole vision here, of course, is it's a fall from unity into division. It's a division uh, an alienation from God, it's an alienation from other people, Eve. Uh, it's an alienation from one's own true self, uh, which of course is, is central to Merton's whole theology, his whole spirituality, 
uh, and he's finding it there in Augusta. So, uh, so this particular uh, volume from the mid 1950s is uh, certainly suffused with Augustinian themes. And even when he's talking about other people like St. Bernard, uh, a lot of it comes from St. Augustine. Uh, another book that he's writing at the end of the 1950s um, is uh, uh, the revision that he does of that pamphlet he wrote for um, St. Mary's College, uh, What is Contemplation, which becomes the inner experience. Uh, and he's kind of tinkering with the last bits of it uh, um, again before he leaves for Asia and never finishes it. Uh, so that it doesn't get published for a good long while until Bill Shannon finally comes along and gets it published, uh, uh, I guess about 20 years ago now, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and this too, we find uh, is very Augustinian. Um, so just one little passage from this uh, that uh, gives us a kind of flavor of this. Um, He's, uh, uh, he says, the Christian is not merely alone with the alone in the Neoplatonic sense, but he is one with all his brothers in Christ. His inner self is in fact inseparable from Christ. And hence it is a mysterious and unique way, in a mysterious and unique way, inseparable from all the other eyes who live in Christ so that they all form one mystical person, which is Christ. For this reason, it's clear that Christian self-realization can never be a merely individualistic affirmation of one's isolated personality. The inner I is certainly the sanctuary of our most personal and individual solitude, and yet paradoxically, it is precisely that which is most solitary and personal in ourselves, which is united with the thou who confronts us. According to the mysterious phrase of St. Augustine, we then become one Christ loving himself, which is from a, one of the Psalm commentaries, right? Uh, if, you're, if you are familiar with, uh, with um, Merton's Notes for a Philosophy of Solitude in, in Disputed Questions, the, the last chapter, the last paragraph of that sounds very similar to this. He doesn't mention Augustine there, but uh, this whole idea of the, the solitary I is also the universal I because it's united with the eye of, with the eye of Christ. I, letter I, not E-Y-E. Uh, and then one more thing from this, from this uh, uh, period, and then we'll get into the 60s, which is a little more uh, confusing perhaps. Um, but uh, um, at the end of, in 1959, uh, he engages in this dialogue with D.T. Suzuki, the great Zen master, which he had hoped was going to be the introduction to his uh, uh, collection of, of translations of the, uh, the uh, Desert Fathers, uh, uh, Wisdom of the Desert, but uh, the authorities wouldn't let it happen. So it was kind of published separately, but it was, it was uh, the dialogue was going on in 1959. Um, and one of the things they get to talk about is the fall. Um, and uh, the fall coming from uh, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here, uh, that whole idea of, you know, what kind of knowledge is this comes through. And Merton turns to Augustine to figure this out. So he says, the question of science and wisdom is an ancient traditional theme in patristic theology, one which played a central part in the spirituality of St. Augustine and all his followers, as well as in the writings of the Greek fathers. And a little later on, he says, uh, uh, talking about this tree of knowledge, he says, let's look uh, more, more closely at a couple of patristic texts to see if we can figure out what this knowledge business is all about. And both of them that he picks are from, are from Augustine. The first one from another one of his commentaries on, on Genesis, this one um, against the Manichaeans. And he says, uh, uh, St. Augustine says, this science is described as the recognition of good and evil because the soul ought to reach out to what is beyond itself, that is to God, and to forget what is beneath himself, that is bodily pleasure. But if the soul deserting God turns in upon itself and wishes to enjoy its own spiritual power as though without God, of course, the whole idea of, uh, you know, the temptation is to be like God without God, uh, then it becomes inflamed with pride, which is the beginning of all sins. 
And when it is thus pub punished for its sin, it learns by experience what a distance separates the good it has deserted and the evil into which it has fallen. This then it was, is what it means to have tasted the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the good and evil, instead of knowing just the good, which is wisdom, you know good and evil separately uh, uh, because you've experienced evil now. And then, the, uh, then again from the De Trinitate, he says, when the soul deserts the wisdom, the sapientia of love, which is always unchanging in one, and desires knowledge, sciencia, from the experience of the temporal and changing things, it becomes puffed up rather than built up. And weighed down in this matter, the soul falls away from blessedness as though from its own heaviness, that it's weighed down by this knowledge. And Merton comments upon this. He says, the self that appears to be weighed down by its love and carried away to material things is in fact an unreal thing, yet it retains an empirical existence of its own. It is what we think of as ourselves, the empirical ego, as he calls it elsewhere. Right? And this empirical existence is strengthened by every act of selfish desire or fear. It is not the true self, the Christian person, the image of God stamped with the likeness of Christ. It is the false self, the disfigured image, the caricature, the emptiness that has swelled up and become full of itself so as to create a kind of fictional substantiality for itself. Such is Augustine's commentary on the phrase of St. Paul, scientia in flat, science, knowledge puffs up. Right? Uh, so again, we see Augustine providing some uh, key phraseology and some key insights for uh, central ideas that, uh, that Merton himself has, uh, has adopted. Given all that, uh, it comes as a kind of surprise that when you get into the 1960s, the beginning of the 1960s anyway, uh, he becomes kind of disillusioned with, uh, with Augustine and ambivalent toward Augustine. Um, uh, I mean, in some sense, it doesn't surprise us, I suppose, because that's, that's sort of the way in which uh, a lot of his enthusiasms go. Uh, but uh, the most extensive discussion he has of Augustine is in his um, lectures, his conferences for newly ordained monks in 1961, uh, that is uh, called Introduction to Christian Mysticism. And he, he goes through Augustine's mystical theology, uh, but he's using a book, uh, called Western Mysticism that was written by a Benedictine abbot, Cuthbert, Cuthbert Butler, uh, which makes this contrast between uh, uh, the Western mysticism of Augustine and Gregory the Great and St. Bernard is a mysticism of light, all right? Uh, and uh, the Eastern mysticism, which is not really authentically Western uh, uh, that you find in Pseudo Dionysius, but you also find in St. John of the Cross and other places is, uh, is you know, the mysticism of darkness, the apophatic mysticism and so on and so forth. And, and this is the era in which of course, Merton is getting more and more interested in Zen uh, as we saw from the, even from the dialogue with Suzuki. Uh, and uh, um, so really kind of emphasizing this total self forgetfulness and uh, the whole idea of no self and uh, uh, you know the uh, the kind of uh, uh, apophasis, the you know the un unknowing that you find in in somebody like Gregory of Nyssa, uh, and so at least for the time being, you know he uh, he Merton goes through. He got ten points on Augustine's uh, mysticism and uh, emphasizing the fact that it's a very much a communal thing. Uh, but uh, there's this real sense of, of dis-ease that he seems to, has, to have here. Uh, probably the first thing he says is his mysticism is highly reflexive and subjective. All the said about subjective piety in the West, all the attempts to lay the blame on this or that later mystic, remind us to look to Augustine as the real source. Uh, and then he kind of cuts back and says, uh, but uh, you know, it's not just individualistic because he has very much a mysticism of the church. Uh, but then he says, you know, is the mysticism of the church really mysticism or is it just kind of piety? Uh, so it's like his, his, his faith in Augustine is getting uh, 
shaken a bit uh, in this whole this whole thing. And uh, his, the last thing he says um, is uh, after quoting all this stuff, um, he says, uh, what's been said so far does not show the greatness of Augustine in these matters. He compares perhaps unfavorably with some of the great Eastern mystics. And uh, it's not even clear whether he's talking about the Eastern Christian mystics or whether he's actually talking about the mystics of, of, uh, um, of uh, Zen and, and, and so on. Um, and then he says, what's important is his vision of the church and so on. Uh, and uh, how it functions in the history of, of uh, the salvation of mankind and so on and so forth. But he gets to the end and he says, uh, you know, it would be difficult to call Augustine the Prince of Mystics, uh, which is what Butler calls him, uh, on the basis of these passages. He's really taking the passages that Butler himself is using and, and kind of questioning them. Um, and uh, uh, shortly after that, in his, uh, in his journal, um, in, in uh, 1962. So this was written in late 19, well, mid 1961. And uh, now this kind of couple expressions of disillusion uh, in the in the um, the refectory. They're reading this huge, big, fat book on Augustine the Bishop by a guy named Vandermeer. Um, and Merton says, monumental, also expensive, and vastly interested. Yet I'm no longer able to be enthusiastic about Augustine. Uh, and then a month later, uh, he gives a kind of uh, uh, enigmatic reason why, uh, just kind of raising questions, especially getting away from the Augustinian psychological treatment of the mystery. In the theology of the Trinity, as we have it in the West, we are under the domination of Augustine's introspective, generally non-mystical contemplation, centered on the self as a medium to that which is above the self meeting of the logos and the soul in the soul's concept of itself, experience of itself, question mark, question mark, surely not mere reflection on our own experience of ourself and hence the Trinity by inference. It must be more than that, right? So it's kind of, he's almost lost faith in what he had said himself in, in the new man here. Um, but luckily it doesn't last. But one more thing that happens around this time, of course, is he's using Augustine uh, for uh, just as he's contrasting Augustine and St. Gregory of Nyssa, which he does, he has charts of, you know, Augustine says this, Gregory of Nyssa says that, and he clearly likes Gregory of Nyssa more, uh, at least in those, uh, those lectures. Uh, we get, uh, when he's talking about uh, war and peace, um, uh, first in um, uh, the unpublishable book, at least uh, of the time of peace in the post-Christian era, and, 1962, and then when he finally gets to talk about peace but not war, uh, he, he includes the same thing written, uh, kind of updated in, in uh, um, Seas of Destruction, but that, that whole uh, section on war in Origin and St. Augustine and contrasting origins, uh, real Christian gospel nonviolence with Augustine's uh, formulation of the just war theory. And you know he's fair to Augustine. He he gives it correctly and and uh, uh, talks about the fact that um, you know perhaps theoretically there's a certain uh, amount of sense to what he's saying uh, that you can uh, um, engage in lethal force as long as your your love of the enemy doesn't disappear. Uh, but he goes on to say that and he says, uh, uh, you know, Augustine is known for his pessimism about human nature, and yet he somehow thinks that this is going to work, right? Uh, so he says the deficiency of Augustinian thought lies therefore not in the good intentions it prescribes, but in an excessive naivete with regard to the good that can be achieved by violent means, which cannot help but call forth all that is worst in man. Uh, so he says, you know, come on, Augustine, uh, uh, people who are living in a fallen world, people who are living, and he, he gives the whole uh, city of God, city of man uh, thing in the center of all this, uh, um, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to rationalize, but that doesn't mean that they're going to actually be able to uh, continue to love their enemy as their, as their slaughtering them, although he says it might have been easier when you were using swords than it is when you're using bombs. So, uh, so you get in the early 1960s then this sense of ambivalence, uh, but by the time you get to the end of his life, uh, 
as we get to the end of our uh, discussion here, uh, we find that Augustine is still, I think, an indispensable figure for him. Right? Uh, so just looking at, at uh, a few quick quotes to tie all this together. Um, in Love and Living, he has these seven words uh, section, and one of the words is theology. And when he describes theology, he says, the classic expression of the task of theology is the saying of St. Augustine inspired by a line of the Septuagint taken up by St. Anselm in the whole medieval tradition, credo ut intelligam, I believe in order to understand. Theology is the intelligence of God that is the fruit of loving, inquiring, investigating faith. Uh, so he goes back to the, the, the base of, of Augustine. Um, and then uh, um, in Contemplation in a World of Action, um, in his essay on uh, uh, contemplation and ecumenism, he says, the monk does not have to prove that technology is good or bad. It's enough for him that God is good. Everything else has its use in the light of God's good purpose. And the important thing is to recognize and apply Augustine's distinction between use and fruition, uh, between means and ends, or his other distinction between science and wisdom, scientia et sapientia. Wisdom embraces and includes science by attaining to the ultimate hidden definitive truth, which is believed rather than known, which is the ground of provisional and changing certitudes behind all that is unveiled and discovered, wisdom touches that which is still veiled and covered. Wisdom brings us into the realm of mystery, not just the realm of clear understanding. And then again in um, Contemplation in the World of Action, um, he said, this is his essay on the cell, which he writes in 67. He says, the cell is the place where man comes to know himself, first of all, that he may know God. Augustine's program, Noverum me, Noverum te, may I know myself, may I know you. He seems to be trusting again the idea that you can move from going within to going beyond. Uh, and in the, the, the last book that he writes for publication, which of course he doesn't know that he's writing for publication, uh, he says much the same thing. Our desire and our prayer should be summed up in St. Augustine's words, Noverum te, Noverum me. He actually switches them around there, puts the, the te first. We wish to gain a true evaluation of ourselves and of the world so as to understand the meaning of our life as children of God, redeemed from sin and death. Uh, these are the aims and goals of meditation. And this preparation for prayer can be prolonged by the slow, sapiential, wisdomly, loving recitation of a favorite psalm, dwelling on the deep sense of the words uh, for us here and now. And in that, that same book, um, uh, actually a little earlier, he says, the concept of the heart refers to the deepest psychological ground of, of one's personality, the inner sanctuary where self-awareness goes beyond analytical reflection and opens out into metaphysical and theological confrontation with the abyss of the unknown yet present, the one who is more intimate to us than we are to ourselves, to adapt a phrase from Augustine's Confessions. So it's like he's made his peace with Augustine uh, that uh, indeed Augustine's way is, is an authentic way. And then, then on the very last day of his life, uh, in his talk, Marxism and, and Monastic uh, Perspectives, um, he's summing up here uh, the monasticism part uh, and you know, what does it mean to be a monk? And he says, the whole purpose of the monastic life is to teach men to live by love. The simple formula, which was so popular in the West, was the Augustinian formula of the translation of cupiditas into caritas, of self-centered love into an ongoing, outgoing, other-centered love. In the process of this change, the individual ego was seen to be illusory and dissolved itself. And in place of this self-centered ego came the Christian person, who is no longer just the individual, but was Christ dwelling in each one. So in each one of us, the Christian person is that which is fully open to all other persons because ultimately all other persons are Christ. And that's Augustine, uh, that's Merton, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Pat, for that look at uh, Augustine and Thomas Merton and how Merton dealt with the fourth, fifth century saint through his life. Uh, you, you've engaged the audience, so uh, the questions have come in. First one was an interesting one for me personally. Kathleen Tarr wonders if you know whether Merton might have gotten his hands on a copy of Leo Tolstoy's uh, Confessions, which is a memoir of sorts about Tolstoy's grappling with his own faith. I've never seen any references to it, no. Yeah, I, I didn't know that, and many of us won't know Tolstoy wrote that, so we've got work to do. Yeah. Yeah, and this one from Chris Pramuk. What prompted Merton to write The New Man? It's a departure from his typical style, more theological than most books. And how did he rank the book against his others? And then well, there's Chris, two questions I can't answer. Yeah, well, he's got one more. Um, how do you view the significance of this period of the mid-50s to the turn into the 60s? Um, yeah, I. it seems to me that the new man, I don't think there was any exterior prompting that I'm aware of. Uh, he originally was calling it existential communion. That was the name. And uh, hmm. there were a couple references in uh, that quote, part of which I read and part of which I didn't, in which uh, that sense of, uh, the um, uh, you know the the earliest uh, um, way the year the earliest version of the whole thing uh, was in some sense the experiential dimension that is there in the in the father's church um, but as far as I know it was it was spontaneous uh, he does talk about it in in the uh, the journal and I haven't looked at that particular passage, but he talks about in, in 1960, I think uh, 1959, 1960, he talks about this is something that I wrote back in, in uh, uh, 1954 during some, I don't know, it wasn't a retreat, but kind of some period of time that he, he could just kind of devote to it. And then he put it away. Um, and uh, as I remember, he, he wasn't all that uh, enthused about it later on. Even when it got published, he was kind of uh, uneasy with it, and so on and so forth. So I don't think it. I don't think it made better, which is the best ranking that he has. But uh, actually, I could, if I can take thirty seconds, I can find it here and not most speculate. Of us couldn't take, most of us couldn't take thirty seconds and find exactly what we want behind us, Pat. <laughs> uh, I'm impressed. Where is the where is where is the chart in here? <laughs> make that make that ninety seconds. Uh, so page one forty nine. Paul Pearson tells us he did not rate the new man. He beat me to the punch. I don't know. I'm not okay. sure what punch. New man, uh, he, uh, I'm wrong, it is better. He, he, he skips it in, the, in his list, it's not here. And uh, he realizes he forgot it. So he, he's got it over here on the other side in the margin. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he says, uh, arrow, new man too, uh, T-O-O. -O. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it is better. Um, so at least when he's making his chart, at least uh, this chart, there's actually more than one chart version of the chart. The one Jim Forrest has is a little different. So, um, but uh, but anyway, it, he ranks it as better, which is the best thing that he gives anything. So yeah, that, that's pretty good. I agree. Good. I think it's better. Uh, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Uh, uh, and uh, but <laughs> do you want Pat? Do you want to say anything about uh, how you view? Uh, its significance in this period from the 50s to the well I, I think it I think it shows how rooted he is in the tradition uh, that he's he's quoting I mean I was re referencing Augustine but uh, plenty of stuff from Bernard plenty of stuff from um, uh, St. John of the Cross it's just it's filled with this it, it makes us realize how uh, how immersed he is in 
the tradition. And you know, when you read when you read New Seeds of Contemplation, or when you read uh, um, uh, No Man Is an Island, or you know some of the devotional books that are very popular, he he very seldom quotes from these these sources. Uh, they're they're you know he he just doesn't mention them. Um, but uh, when you read them in the context of some of these other more, uh, they're certainly not scholarly in the sense of, of uh, academic scholarship, but ones in which, in which he's really drawing on the tradition, you realize that so much of what he says about the true self and the false self, so much of what he says about wisdom is, uh, is rooted in his, uh, reading of this stuff over and over and over again uh, um, over the course of, of you know, the 27 years that he's in the monastery. So it gives us a sense of where, he, uh, where he's drawing from, that it's not just all kind of, and, and of course it's the intersection of the tradition with the present that makes Merton as uh, I think effective as he actually is, he's he's able to uh, to bring those two dimensions together in ways that um, uh, those who are interested in the tradition can certainly uh, appreciate, but those who are interested in what's going on in the here and now, and hopefully the people that are interested in both uh, can can appreciate it as well. So uh, I think it. it for me, anyway, it gives us a sense of, you know, where he's coming from and uh, mm -hmm. and why he's coming from there. Yeah, of course, Augustine or Augustine was so dominant that, well, I was going to say half the people or more are Augustinian after him, and so in some ways he becomes tradition or much of tradition yeah. reflects Augustine. It's interesting though that he is. I mean, he has very little on uh, the controversial stuff. I mean, he'll touch on. The, uh, uh, the Pelagian controversy when he's talking about Cashin and so on and so forth. Uh, but, you know, a lot of predestination, I don't know if the word even occurs uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his writing. If it does, it certainly is not prominent. Um, but, and, and it, you know, we, over and over again, when he's doing Camus, uh, he, he's constantly bringing us to Camus. He's, he's always talking about the fact that Camus did his master's thesis at the University of Algiers on on Augustine and, uh, and Neoplatonism and so on and so forth. And um, he has this, uh, a, a tape that he did from the, from the Hermitage when he, he, reads, he reads Camus uh, uh, master's thesis, uh, yeah. which evidently got published somewhere in French, I presume, uh, but, and, and kind of goes through it and, and talks about why um, Camus has so much problem with Augustine. And at the end, and he comes out and says, uh, uh, you know, he has all these good points to make, but as far as I'm concerned, what Augustine says, you know, that grace is necessary, that grace is essential. I just, you know, I believe that, all right? So, so the, the end of the tape, he doesn't explain or he doesn't kind of argue with him or anything. He just says, I'm in it for grace. I, I, uh, I'm not gonna let go of grace even, but I'm not gonna go, you know, if if you don't get grace, then you're then you're damned. Or never gets into that, as far as I know, but uh, but definitely that sense of total reliance on God, even in even in, in a context like that, uh, you know, very up to date thing. You know, the seven essays on Camus that he writes, I think four of them at least he mentions uh, uh, the, uh, Camus writing uh, uh, his uh, his master's thesis there. Interesting. So, I don't know. I don't know if that answered anything that you would. No, that was uh, it's interesting just to hear you go on and expand that sort of thing. Um, to turn the corner, a very different kind of question, but from our own Paul Pearson, uh, did Brahmakari's other recommendation to Merton, the imitation of Christ, have more or less impact on Merton than Augustine's confession? Well, I think it had less impact, but but that one too. I don't think he read. If if you read. Uh, uh, <laughs> Run to the mountain. Uh, the the section when he's when he's at Gethsemane, he's reading he's reading uh, um, the imitation of Christ. he's reading the imitation of Christ in in uh, in Latin. Uh, but you know it looks like he's he's reading that for the first time when he's actually on retreat there. He read he reads that and then he reads the uh, the De Diligendo Deo the the uh, 
on loving God of St. Bernard when he's there. And he quotes from those two things. Mm -hmm. uh, or the, but, but I think it's the same thing that uh, um, he's, he, he didn't run right out and buy these, <laughs> buy these books. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he's talking in 1946 when he's writing Seven Story Mountain, uh, kind of from a distance uh, that they were important. But I think, I think the, the uh, spirituality of the, uh, the imitation, which is, you know, much more kind of withdrawal from the world. I mean, maybe it, it's influencing him early on, but I think in the law, it certainly doesn't have the long run and certainly there's not as much to read in, in the imitation as there is in Augustine. I mean, yeah. Augustine is like this in the, uh, the uh, Patrologia Romana or Latina. It's a whole shelf full of stuff and he doesn't even come near reading all of it, but he certainly continues to read stuff. Uh, whereas you read The Imitation of Christ, you can read it over and over again, but there's not much else by Thomas Akempis that's available or anybody knows about. That's true. Well, Teresa rightly in introduced you as one of the preeminent scholars of, of the Merton world. And in some ways you've proven that again tonight. I, I, I'm gonna finish uh, with this last question, which I like to ask people, and then we can throw it back to Teresa. So Pat, what did you learn in preparing for tonight? You know so much. Did you learn anything in, in preparing for tonight? Oh, sure. I mean, I think, I think right from the very beginning, I had assumed that uh, he ran out and got Augustine, uh, got the confessions, and, and was there the next day reading it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that, we, I just read a, quite a good book uh, that was just published on, on uh, Merton, and uh, there's a kind of biographical section in it, and it, it says, then he read Augustine, and then he decided to become a Catholic. And uh, so I think a lot of us have this kind of sense of, um, you know, what he said without, unless, unless we've reread a lot of this stuff recently. Uh, so an awful lot, and, and reading Bread in the Wilderness, for example, or re-looking at Bread in the Wilderness, uh, um, realizing just how much he's drawn on Augustine. So, uh, you know, when you know what to look for, and, you know, you could have a whole different kind of lens to be looking through and you'd get a lot of other stuff. But if you're looking at Augustine stuff, you know, I knew what he had written in, in uh, Seeds of Destruction. I knew what he had written in Introduction to Christian Mysticism, but I really hadn't paid too much attention to what he's written in about it. Like The New Man, I mean, I've read that a number of times over the course of the years, but wasn't focusing on Augustine. So uh, uh, when you discover, or, or, you know, seeing what he has to, you know, that those two quotes that he's got in Mystics and Zen, in, in uh, Zen and the Birds and Appetite about Scientia and Sapientia. You know, I would have, I've probably read that three or four times at least, but when you're looking at it, you say, oh, wow, this is where this comes from. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what happened as I was going through. Great. Thank you. Well, Pat, thank you so very much for your um, just delightful presentation, and it's so informative. I'm just so pleased that you were able to do this for us this evening, and I enjoyed it tremendously. I had the feeling that with every sentence that you that you stated, you could have gone on with a paragraph or more. So I know oh, that you had to pull it all back. That is certainly true. <laughs> thank you so much. It was great. I had to pare it down. I had to pare it down. Yeah. Well, that was, that was it. And there you're back to Augustine with the pear, huh? Uh, Wasn't oh, there the pear? <laughs> Sorry. <Bad> pun, <laughs> Good fun, actually. Yeah, okay, sorry I'll about that. Can work that in somehow. <laughs> I was going to talk about a pair of prayers at the beginning, and I avoided that, but maybe I should have. Oh, you did, and so I, I had to bring it up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, I also want to thank Dan Horan and the Spirituality Center at St. Mary's College for providing the Zoom platform and the technical support for Tuesdays with Merton. Thank Ellen Sculpe. Uh, Sculpe. I want to say skillfully, and I got scope in, in <laughs> place of hope. So Ellen, uh, forgive me. And Ellen, uh, thank you again for so skillfully moderating those questions. Bob Grip will be posting this um, uh, session on um, YouTube very soon. And he does the posting for all of our uh, Tuesdays with Merton sessions.
I want to thank Margaret, uh, Mark Mead. Something's wrong with me this evening. Not Margaret Mead, but Mark Mead. <laughs> these available as podcasts. And, um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today and for continuing to spread the good word about Tuesdays with Merton. You can find links to the recordings of previous webinars at merton.org slash ITMS. There you will also find information about the International Thomas Merton Society. If you are not already a member, we invite you to consider joining. We also welcome donations to support Tuesdays with Merton. Registration is now open for next month's webinar when Jim Robinson will speak on spirituality, sustainability, and social justice, embodying integral ecology with Thomas Merton and Rosemary Radford Ruther. So for now, goodbye, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you next month.